I am Malcolm Chalmers. I'm the research director here at RUSI, uh, and I'm really delighted uh, to see such a full house today and so many cameras. So there's obviously a lot of interest in what uh, the commissioner will be saying to us, so I won't uh, uh, tarry. Um, uh, RUSI has done a lot of work uh, on this agenda uh, over recent years, counterterrorism clearly a very central part of what we do in this country in confronting uh, the security threats we face. And I think there are very few of any practitioners who are better placed uh, to give us a sense of where we are uh, than Mark Rowley, who's of course the Assistant Commissioner for Specialist Operations in the Metropolitan Police and heads the CT Policing Network in the UK. Uh, the, both the presentation and the Q&A will be on the record, uh, so anything can be uh, quoted. Uh, and uh, since there's quite a number of members of our media here, uh, I, I, I hope some of it will be quoted. <laughs> uh, so, Mark, it's over to you, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, the National Policing Lead for uh, Counterterrorism for the last 18 months or so, uh, gives me a particular insight in this un unusual time there we face a very significant and changing threat. And having the privilege of leading that network, I, I just want to spend some time today uh, briefly describing the threat, but I particularly want to get underneath it and some of the particular dimensions and challenges that we're facing as we're constantly having to develop the way the counterterrorism policing network is operating um, with partners and, and locally. So where I want to come to after a brief introduction is to talk about how the roots of terrorism, the roots of the high-risk operations that tend to be what gets reported, they reach in three directions, and those are the directions that challenge us. There's three directions. They reach globally, they reach locally, and they reach into the virtual world. But first, as I say, I'm just going to talk briefly about the complexity and nature of the threat. Obviously, you all know the attack. Uh, the the, the um, threat level is currently severe, um, meaning an attack is highly likely. And whilst we're principally concerned with ISIL and those directly inspired by them, um, we shouldn't forget there are wider terrorist issues we have to worry about at the moment, including uh, extreme right-wing activity, which, to some degree, um, preys on the um, on the ISIL threat. We're making an arrest today. We've said that many times before. And um, Andrew Parker, Director General of the Security Service, has talked about how um, collectively um, we've disrupted um, six plots in the last in the last year. Been a massive increase in counterterrorism arrests, and say so we're now doing sort of about 90 to 110 arrests every quarter. If you look back over the last 10 or 15 years, um, the only quarters that have been anywhere near that were the quarter after 9/11 and the quarter after 7/7. Yet that's a sustained level of activity we're having to maintain quarter on quarter, year on year. The threat has changed so much, it's actually quite hard to get your hands around it. I've got seven um, descriptors here that I was just going to canter through quickly just to give you my personal take on the degree of change and the complexity of it. So it's bigger in scale is the first one. So we're now running about 45% more investigations than we, than we were uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and that's over 600 separate investigations across the counterterrorism and policing network. Um, the majority jointly with the security service, but uh, sort of a third of them also um, solely police activity. We've got 85 people waiting trial at the moment. Secondly, it's more uncertain. I think it's interesting to reflect that previous terrorist threats have been a very stable group of people working in tight organisations. Today, that's not the case, perhaps best indicated by the fact that about half of those travelling to Syria to get involved in what's going on there weren't previously on our radar. And that reflects our seeing ISIL move more from uh, moving terrorism from being about an organisation to try and generate a following or, or a cult. So it's bigger, it's more uncertain. Third, it's faster. The, uh, 
the flash to bang, to use an, 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 an inelegant phrase, um, is much quicker. In February, um, Brustrom's emr &E was given 22 years. Last year, he went from April, being a Jehovah's Witness about to convert, to August, walking out of his front door with a um, um, large knife, a hammer, and a black flag, planning on committing a terrorist murder. To do that in a few weeks illustrates the challenges that we face. So it's faster. It's more diffuse. That scale brings a sort of uh, uh, not clear edges, the number of young people, the number of, uh, number of women, people who we haven't seen involved in terrorism before. So uh, I think it's about one in six are 20 or younger, for, for example, at the moment. That's very different. It's more volatile. Big links to mental health. Um, it's interesting now that some of our operations we're having to run um, where the operational commanders are taking counsel from uh, specialist psychologists in terms of understanding what's going on with um, potential offenders. And that's just indicative of the nature of the threat that we're, we're wrestling with. There's a greater variety. So the range of potential attacks range from the individual with a crude knife attack through to complex um, marauding firearms attacks and we've seen examples of those tragically successful in, in, in Western countries in the last year. And the seventh um, point I was going to make, obvious, the global impact grows. Uh, according to the US Department of State, uh, their calculations are about 33,000 people across the world killed by terrorism last year, which is about double the previous year. So you look at those dimensions, and it's a massively changing, um, massively changing problem. But as I say, I think underneath that, what we see are routes that reach in three directions that we have to tackle. So the routes that are about the local, the virtual, and the international. I think Friday's case is an interesting illustrator of exactly that. So on Friday, we saw a 15-year-old from Blackburn given... Life, a life sentence with a minimum of five years for preparatory acts of terrorism, um, partly in relation to um, trying to um, organise an attack in Australia on Anzac Day. I think to have a 15-year-old part of global plots, we wouldn't have believed that a couple of years ago. But it illustrates the challenges today. So firstly, the international dimension. You've got somebody here, both influenced from... Syria and Iraq, and then organising activity across the globe. You've got the virtual dimension, so that influence on him and his ability to operate was enhanced by cyberspace. And you've got the very local issues, those reported in the paper, people reporting concern about him, and um, local efforts to try and deal with his growing radicalisation. So you've got those dimensions that I want to look into. So I'm going to do those one at a time briefly on international, but I want to labour more on what police and partners are doing locally, particularly since the prevent duty, and then the challenges in operating in, uh, in a virtual world. But briefly, as I say, internationally first. Over a quarter of our investigations have an international link. And the number of failed states, ungoverned spaces, which provide the perfect base for terrorists to operate from, uh, has grown in recent years. And I think it's sad to say that regardless of the long-term situation in Syria and Iraq, there are other potential footholds for terrorism, um, which are fairly obvious, that will still present challenges beyond that. We've got over 750 um, British foreign fighters now who've travelled to, to, travel to fight, and as we've said before, about half of them have returned. Some of, that, it, some of those um, people looking to travel has been mitigated through international cooperation. We have, over recent years, strengthened the CT uh, counterterrorism policing international network to deal with this greater international, uh, greater international challenge. What we're doing there is our operations that require international evidence, where it hastens our ability to collect that. We are working with source countries um, to help them with their operations to try and intercept terrorism at source. 
In some countries, we're helping with capacity and capability building, um, programs sponsored by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And as we tragically saw with, uh, with, with SUS, the attack in, uh, in Tunisia recently, um, we're increasingly having to have the capacity in country as a springboard to surge forward and help with local investigations when there are attacks on British people and British interests. Uh, I think the number of deaths in recent years of um, British people overseas from terrorism is, I think it's 52 in many attacks, and that is a big change on previous years. So that international network is an increasingly a part of what we do. And I think it just illustrates the police counter-terrorism operations. We are uniquely placed because we reach from the international to the local. We're the only agency who can be doing partnership at a local level and working internationally at the same time. So, looking locally then. We've said for a long time, communities defeat terrorism. I'm not sure we've always described it as well as, as, well as we might do. But that phrase and the meaning behind it is, in my view, more critical today than ever because of that more diffuse and local nature of terrorism today, as illustrated by the Blackburn case from Friday. So whilst we focus on police and MI5 operations where we've got the hundreds of riskiest individuals that we're constantly prioritising our um, high-profile operations against. Meanwhile, um, extremism and radicalisation is taking place underneath that. And there are thousands of people who we have to pay some, some wider attention to. It all reflects the change in terrorist methodology from being a tight organisation to a cult that is um, trying to prey on the vulnerable and exploit them. <coughs> the number of young people, the number of people with mental health issues illustrates that determination to prey on the vulnerable, something that we would not have seen previous terrorist organisations do. If you add that preying on the vulnerable to the challenges we face in the virtual world with our growing blind spots, which I'll come more fully to later, we see the increasing challenges of protecting the public today. Of all the other, uh, I've worked in sort of mainstream local policing and specialist policing on and off in my career, and CT counterterrorism policing is unique. It's unique because the expectations in terms of countering terrorism is everyone wants there to be no attacks. In no other area of crime do we aim for um, an absence of any events whatsoever. It's a massive challenge that we take on, and whilst we can't be completely successful, we have a very good track record. But you're reminded, particularly with a changing threat like that, of that oft-quoted um, IRA um, comment after the Brighton bomb, um, remember, we only have to be lucky once, you have to be lucky always. And I think it's our activity at a local level, at the hub of what communities, partner agencies and security intelligence agencies can do, that adds to our luck because of our ability to spot and intercept extremism and vulnerability. There's a lot of talk in sort of the media about the prevent brand and that's not really for me to comment upon. The things that matter to me are the practicalities of relationship at a local level where, from a policing perspective, we're trying to bridge the gap between the more preventative agencies, uh, such, as, um, such as local authorities, health services, and intelligence agencies, and the relationships with the communities. We're trying to operate in that space with a combination of prevention, of safeguarding the vulnerable, and of disru disrupting those looking to exploit them. And what matters to me is practically the relationships. Are they working and do we have people's trust? Trust in the police is much greater than it's given credit for. I think if we look more widely before I focus on counter-terrorism, I think over the last eight years, the um, national survey that the Home Office Commission shows that confidence in local policing across the country grew from 63% to 76%. That's a very big, um, very big surge. And counter-terrorism policing at the local level, our prevent officers doing engagement and doing, uh, doing other work, 
um, with these challenging cases are a part of that. Uh, we commissioned a youth survey recently um, which interestingly found that young people, the majority of them, more than half of them, if they were concerned about somebody being drawn towards radicalisation extremism, would report it to the police. And indeed, when asked a whole series of questions about family, friends, teachers, um, social workers, police, etc., the only group that they would, they were more keen to tell, uh, to report things to, were their family. After family, second equal came friends and the police. That's a matter of great reassurance to me that there's trust and confidence in, cancer, in policing and in cancer terrorism policing at a local level. That helps us perform that bridging function that, that I've already mentioned. And we've seen the benefits of this as we've done increasing number of appeals over the last year for public health um, and particularly I think with the uh, statutory duty for um, prevention that, that, that came to being earlier in the year. We've seen a big surge in the product of that trust. So, for example, um, our cancer terrorism internet referral unit that is trying to take um, sort of extremist and radicalised radicalising postings off the internet, they are uh, they have seen um, in the last year a fourfold growth in the number of referrals from members of the public. Part of what we do is looking at ourselves and from our operations what. Um, what sites and postings we find to take on. Part of it comes from referrals from the public. The fact that's grown fourfold, I think, is, is, is um, very impressive and very valuable. Um, and that's helped us go now to, I think, it's about 2,000 um, sites a month, that 2,000 postings a month are being taken down. The other indicator, second indicator of three I was going to mention was we've seen a 25% growth in the number of calls to the anti-terrorism hotline. Again, more evidence of people responding to our appeals and demonstrating trust. The third that demonstrates that from my perspective is I think directly on the back of the prevent duty. So when young people say I, I would be quite likely to tell the police, we are currently dealing with in total, and I'll explain where they come from, around 600 referrals a month of concern about individuals, 600 across the country. That's an, enorm uh, that's an enormous number. Now, um, of those, about a third are coming from statutory bodies, if you like, shorthand for schools, councils, youth services, mental health services, etc., um, responding to that statutory duty and referring many, many more cases of concern to the police. Interestingly, um, over that sort of over that period, about there's about 50 a month coming from community, family, and friends, and faith leaders. You wouldn't expect the biggest number from them, but that's a, a steady flow of one or two a day where people very close to individuals are um, picking up the phone and referring into the into the police. Portion of the others come from within policing and from other enforcement agencies who spot people of concern. Sometimes on counter-terrorism operations, indeed, we're focusing on these six individuals and we spot two or three vulnerable people around the outside and those may get referred into the system. What we find, the majority of those referrals, a lot of them on proper examination against our intelligence, but more importantly, proper examination against the information held in councils and, and new services, etc., show nothing to be worried about. Um, that's about two-thirds of them. I think uh, there's about 20% of them where, whilst there's no proven link to counter-terrorism, we are concerned um, about their vulnerability. And that's not a matter for the police. So having done that joint scoping, it will probably end up with mental health or youth services to, to put some supportive package around them. And then a little over 10% are cases where, collectively at a local level, police, um, schools, education, local authorities, um, health, have to sit around a table and try and deal with the situation where you have got somebody who's been um, potentially um, on, the, on a path towards radicalisation, maybe being influenced by extremists. Um, so how do you safeguard them and how do you disrupt the extremists? And the police are acting as the focal point for those referrals. The trust people have in us helps us do that. We're at the point of nexus for the information and then we're able to choreograph that local partnership, albeit if it's a supportive and preventative intervention, most of those will pass on to others. However, if it's a disruptive intervention, um, that's when the police powers come to the fore. 
that. Interestingly, over the last um, uh, this year, sorry, the first quarter of, uh, of this year, um, I mean from April to July, we just some examples of the successes of this program. We've had 19 individuals who we would say from the joint work that's been done at local level have been prevented travelling to Syria. We've got 55 um, people who've had aspirations to travel to Syria, um, so they haven't got as far as planning yet, um, and the, the local partnership work has changed their mind this way and from that, that's no longer something they're looking to, towards doing. Um, and we've identified 110 um, individuals who have been involved in extreme, extremism surrounding Syria who again have been um, either disrupted or dissuaded from um, staying involved with that. So it's making a real difference locally. The police disruptive activity is critical. So one high profile extremist group, uh, we um, secured, I think it was double figures of antisocial behavior orders to disrupt them. Um, and that has um, made it hard for them to associate, made it hard for them to hold the meetings and the gatherings that they intend to, and made it harder for them to, uh, to to radicalise and, and, um, and generate the recruits for ISIL that they're looking to do. So looking across, uh, across this, it's a good, it, the good examples of how um, we are operating at that nexus. Disruption is an increasing part of what we do. So when we talk about counter-terrorism policing across the country making an arrest today, underneath that is a lot of disruption of extremism at a local level. So about... 30% of the arrests we're making are under terrorism legislation, preparatory tracks for terrorism or material that's useful for the terrorists. The remainder tends to be using crime powers. Crime powers, um, street robbery, um, fraud, sexual offending, whatever we can do to disrupt people who are, have any terrorist aspirations or involved in extremism. That proportion has grown significantly and I think one of the key factors in our success over the last year, as I say, has been the local relationships that we in CT policing have. To, be, to have this unusual structure that's developed over the last, um, last decade, which is particularly well suited today, to have a nationally coordinated approach from Scotland Yard with local teams embedded in regional units across the country, um, nationally coordinated, locally embedded, generates that ability to operate operationally nationally but to have those partnerships and that trust at a local level. And I think the nature of this threat makes that particularly useful. The third area I was going to focus on was the virtual. Something that is obviously in increasingly topical and challenging. Of course, the changes in technology over the last, um, last five years or so have given major benefits to all of us, individually, the businesses and organisations that we, we work in. And that's fantastic, and no one wants to stand in the way of that. But of course, we see some of the flip side of that, where the increased use of technology provides new and sometimes better ways to commit crime, fraud, can, um, and, uh, sexual exploitation, on, a, on, on occasion, um, uh, terrorism planning. It can allow terrorists in Syria to communicate with extremists in the UK. And you won't be surprised that uh, sort of pretty much every counter-terrorism case we have involves communications and communications data to some degree, and I think it's about 95% with serious crime. It's a tactic which is critical to policing today, not just in counter-terrorism, because it's critical to how everyone lives their lives. Of those three areas I've spoken about, reaching internationally, reaching locally, and the virtual world, this is the one, you won't be surprised perhaps to hear, is of greatest concern to us. I think David Anderson QC, the independent reviewer of counterterrorism legislation, um, hit the nail on the head when he talked in his recent report about the growth of no-go areas. And to some extent, that echoed the findings of Ruth's own report not long before that. And I think from a policing perspective, any area which is no-go to police and intelligence agencies, because we don't have the powers or the technology or the ability to reach there, but is a space that terrorists and criminals can operate is of massive concern. Until very recently, and it's developed over the last five years perhaps, there were far fewer no-go areas and they were far, uh, far less understood. 
that has changed very significantly. It's changed, I think, in um, three ways. The progressive sort of degradation of our ability to work online to protect the public um, is down, in my view, to three reasons. And the latter two of these, I think, are a post-Snowden effect. The first one is about, uh, is about technology. Technology and its diversification and growing complexity was always going to pre present increasing challenges for us. Always going to create the risk of no-go areas from a policing and intelligence perspective. But the second and third were more avoid avoidable. The second, communications and social media companies we are seeing as being increasingly fragmented in their ability and their willingness to assist police and intelligence agencies. And thirdly, we now see criminals and terrorists better educated, better informed as to where our blind spots are and therefore better able to operate safely. So examples that illustrate this, I just want to go through some examples. And this is where, this is a very big challenge for us, you can understand, because clearly giving too much detail on an example about what we can and can't do is simply going to help the terrorists with um, more information about how to operate. Uh, and then I would simply be um, repeating the, the, the sin of Snowden. So I have to be careful in what I say, and I'm sure you'll understand that. But I just want to try and illustrate the degree of challenge that we're facing. So we've had terrorist cases um, in the last past year where our digital surveillance gaps have meant that as the plot has developed, we've been unsighted on the exact details of what they're planning. That wouldn't have been the place 10 years ago with AQ plots or, or further back with, with Irish-related terrorism. And of course, the permanent challenge for CT policing is um, we've got the security intelligence agencies providing massive insight and intelligence and finding it harder to do so. And we're constantly trying to balance evidence and public safety. If we jump too early without enough evidence, then we, we have people in custody for a few days, we run out of runway, and they're back on the streets, better informed about what we know about them. Conversely, of course, if we run it too late, then the consequences are potentially awful. So we've had operations in the last year where we've made arrests with a worrying degree of uncertainty is exactly on the timing and nature of the time and the nature of the plot. And indeed, a degree of uncertainty about whether we're going to be able to get to sufficient evidence in the 14 days that you have to have people in custody. So far, we've managed to be successful and bring those critical cases to charge. But in several occasions, we've discovered far more post-arrest about the detail of attack planning um, and the, about their communications and about their online, online activity, things that, despite all the efforts of the state, we were largely unsighted on before the arrests. A second example, um, encryption is obviously a, a, a sort of growing issue in its sort of many forms in terms of communications and storage of data. Um, we have had occasions where we've had to prolong dangerous operations, we've had to delay arrests until we can confidently obtain evidence because encryption has been slowing our progress down. Now that delay makes us, very, makes us all very nervous as you'll understand. And I say we're trying to get that balance. How quickly can we get the evidence to put these people in prison for a long time? And indeed, all counter-terrorism operations are now more patchy in their intelligence than we've ever seen before. And whilst I lead um, for counter-terrorism, this isn't just an issue of counter-terrorism, it's an issue for organised crime and, and other matters. And so I know Commissioner um, Adrian Leppard, the City of London, who leads for us on fraud, would say there's going to be about 3 million frauds a year added to the crime stats um, in forthcoming years as we're improving recording of online fraud. He says that more than two-thirds of those are cyber-enabled. And increasingly, there are cases in there where the person at the end of the device that has committed the fraud can't be found because we don't have the, the, the legislation or the, or the technology to do it. You have similar challenges with finding online paedophiles where we, there are increasing occasions where we don't succeed. And this goes all the way through to day-to-day -day cases of vulnerable people who go missing, perhaps being sexually exploited, 
and our ability to get the data that protects them. So whilst I'm focused on at the moment about on counter-terrorism, this runs across this this growing number of blind spots and implications runs across policing. Our experience of social media and, and communications companies is of a very fragmented and highly variable level of cooperation, ranging from some who are very cooperative to those who are partially cooperative and those who are at the other end of the spectrum. Some refuse to assist. For some, it's also part of their strategy. Um, they design their products in full recognition that they'll be unable to help us because of the way they've designed them. And some simply undermine us by adopting a policy that if they supply data to us, they will tell the subject that they've done that. So that's not desperately helpful to covert operations, as you can understand. I think one of the challenges here is this is an immature business sector that's grown over the last couple of decades. If I compare to uh, the uh, financial sector, and particularly banks, we have a well-established principle that the banking sector will make reasonable endeavours to spot corrupt or dishonest monies going through their system and proactively report it to, uh, to law enforcement and the police through the um, National Crime Agency's um, point of contact. They have no problem with the principle that what goes through their pipes, they have some duties of due diligence on. That's a much older um, sector. We're still wrestling with that, I think, with the communications and social media sector. Some are more constructive and see themselves having a social responsibility for what goes on on their platforms, um, and some, um, some do not. In the real world, if someone was to open a shopping centre in London with a fantastic new business model which made them large amounts of profit but also provided a safe operating environment for criminals or terrorists, we wouldn't allow it. Yet to some degree, that's what's going on in the virtual world, I would suggest. So we're constantly investing in new technology and further enhancing the skills of our detectives and indeed also re recruiting sort of cyber specialists. But I think in order to return to the ability to tackle criminals and terrorists of, of a few years ago, there's three steps required. This is simply for me about our ability to reach wherever terrorists and criminals operate, with the right legal powers, with the right safeguards, all of that taken as read. This is not about everybody's communications, it's about terrorists and criminals. Three things, there's up-to-date legislation that enables us to operate in the modern digital age. There's the improved international agreements and cooperation between jurisdictions that will enable us to operate at speed. And thirdly, we do need the constructive practical help of social media and communications companies to support and request, uh, support our requests and try to work in a way where they're minimising our blind spots, not, uh, not growing them. So to step back and summarise, um, I've talked about the current threat. I've talked about some of the challenges internationally, locally, and in the digital world, and some of the key challenges in confronting it. Our, um, I think, underneath our successes are um, three strengths of our current operating model. We've got an extraordinary working relationship between the police and the security intelligence agencies, particularly MI5, that's taken a lot of development to be candid over the last 40 years, but our ability to operate with their strengths and our strengths together is envied the world over. <laughs> our second strength is the trust and confidence of communities, which is helping fill some of the gaps with those rapidly growing number of reports that we've seen that I've described. And the third strength is the international reputation of British policing and the Scotland Yard brand, if you like our ability across the world to build relationships and um, use that both to help frustrate terrorism at source and help us build cases in the UK is very useful. So we have those three strengths, but we have a growing Achilles heel that if it's not tackled, um, it will slowly diminish our ability to keep the public safe. As I say, there are the three things I think we need. We need updated legislation, we need to improve international cooperation, 
and we need a proactive and socially responsible approach from communications and social media companies. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening. Well, th thank you very much indeed, Mark. The, there are a few seats near the front for those who are standing at the back and wish to have a, a seat. That, that would be fine. Uh, we have, we think, uh, I think we have about 25 minutes for q and I thought that was a very comprehensive and detailed presentation. I certainly learnt a lot, and there's a lot more which I'm sure people would like to find out both about the current state of play. And I also, I think the rather clear and stark challenge you put out, perhaps particularly to our communications and social media companies about uh, what needs to be done if we are to maintain current levels of protection. Uh, if you'd like to indicate, we have some microphones. I think we have, uh, we have two microphones, so please wait for the microphone to come to you and please say uh, who, whoops, who you are and where you're from. There's a gentleman just at the back here with his hand up. Um, hello, uh, John Ingham, Daily Express. Uh, Could you stand up? Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, John Ingham, Daily Express. Um, towards the end, when you were talking about social media companies and communications firms, you said how they undermine you, and I'm afraid I didn't hear what you said. So could you just enlarge on that again, please? Uh, I think the point I was saying was that some companies have adopted a policy that if we ask for data that relates to Mark Rowley's communications, they are prepared to provide it, but they will tell Mark Rowley they've done so. If we're running a covert investigation, as I said, that's not desperately helpful. Here, please. Uh, could you wait for the microphone? Caroline. Caroline Flynn McLeod. Uh, not as billed here. I'm actually Terrington Management. I've been billed as some kind of reporter, but I'm not. <laughs> um, uh, Mark, uh, I think, first of all, thank you for the most fantastic job you and your team actually do to help keep us safe. Um, and one, in these contexts, doesn't want to harp on, on failures. But I wonder whether you could perhaps um, give some insights into the failures of the counter-radicalization program that the young gentleman who was, if we can call him that, who was jailed last week, uh, was put on uh, because it's very important to understand that failure because there are so many young people uh, being engaged on it and, and, and certainly also I was at the time a bit concerned about one of the comments of the police officers that day who um, said well if he uh, knew that he was on our horizon he should have been worried I'm paraphrasing but it was something along those lines and actually, to me, that suggested a lack of understanding of the mindset of that young person because he's the sort of person that doesn't care. Do you want to come back to those? Uh, yeah. So um, in terms of, I think, using a sort of binary failure and success, I mean, clearly, there was an attempt at counter-radicalising, uh, sort of de-radicalising, and that didn't succeed. I don't think we're... At, there's no programme in the world, whether it's about... Um, and counter gang programs, um, sort of rehabilitation programs for all sorts of offenders, let alone something as complex as counter radicalization. There's no program in the world that's 100% successful. Um, I think if you look at um, some of the data we've got in terms of some of that wider preventative activity that um, local agencies do, or the specific data on the channel initiative that the Home Office coordinates, there is some powerful evidence that there's a lot of successes there. But we are sometimes going to fail, aren't we? Just as we do with gang members, just as we do with sex offenders. Every time we don't succeed, of course, we should see what can be learned from it. But I think to, you, would, you wouldn't sort of slam a prevention program in a gang sphere because one person went back to gang violence. I don't think we should do it in this area either. I think the comment about um, the, the um, given the young man will have been a, aware of interested in because of the, the programs etc he's put on uh, I can understand that why the why the officer concerns says it I think some young people caught early enough well it does clearly sober them up to think hang on everyone's focused on me and it, it affects the way family deal with them it affects the way friends deal with them and it does help push them towards back engaging with the program properly and reform for some individuals who are completely hell-bent on whether it's gang violence or 
terrorism, it's not going to work. Hmm. The gentleman here. Thank you, uh, Charles Bennett, member here, director of European Atlantic Group. Obviously, your main focus is and has to be on Islamist extremist yes. terrorism in Britain. But in Northern Ireland, we've seen uh, an expected and gradual resurgence of terrorist violence. If that was repeated on the same scale here, there would be mass political panic. That is obviously in isolation in the province. But I wonder if you have anything to say about the, any, any Irish Republican terrorist threat on the UK mainland. Thank uh, you. It wasn't where I was going to focus. I did. I mean, there are many sort of strands of yeah. terrorism, clearly. And I was focusing them on the greatest concern at the moment. The uh, growing challenges in, in um, Northern Ireland is obviously a, a matter of concern, and we're continually in touch with the uh, um, uh, PSNI in terms of their operations and, and what they're dealing with. They're facing some really big challenges, you say, and I'm not going to go into the detail here. But, I mean, there are other strands of terrorism. It's important not to forget, as I said earlier, extreme right-wing terrorism. Um, extreme right-wing terrorism has had a bit of a resurgence, partly as a kickback against the sort of... Um, ISIL type brand, it gives a way for a um, sort of very um, uh, uh, sort of xenophobic, racist um, agenda to get an extra foothold. And we've, over the last 18 months, um, a couple of times had to surge some of our activity towards extreme right wing effort as well. Hmm. Okay. Gentleman here. Thank you. Hugo Rosemont, a member and also King's College London. Um, it's with regards to the cooperation or, or non cooperation with companies and that issue. And we are uh, hearing a lot of frustration, I think, from yourself and others, uh, the Director General of the Security Service, talking about an ethical responsibility, social responsibility, and so on. Um, I was very interested in your analogy with the shopping centre, um, but is not part of the problem that shopping centres, for example, if one was going to be built tomorrow, there would be many existing mechanisms for working with the, the, the private sector, yet in this domain that we're talking about, we simply don't have... Um, some of the structures and mechanisms uh, with the private sector. And so my, my question is a practical one, if I may, which is what is the role of government in, in fact, and the state agencies in forming the level of cooperation with the private sector, including with regards to structures for cooperation? Thank you. I, I agree that to a point that the infrastructure and structures aren't as mature, but we have had good mechanisms for the last 20 years. I think there are two factors that make those mechanisms less successful now. One is the growing number of providers and the increasing complexity, so it's stretching the effectiveness of those mechanisms. But actually, um, I think post Snowden and some of the debate that's followed, it's caused some organizations, some social media and communications companies to deliberately step back and get, to, and, and, and step back and be less cooperative. So it's not simply about mechanisms, it's about Part of it's about attitude. Mm. That said, it is a massive challenge for government, and um, I am sort of cited on the enormous efforts government is making to try and build international agreements, for example, so that we can operate at speed across the world. We see cases where basic data requests made post arrest are still not through, sort of six or nine months later when the trial starts, and that's evidence that isn't there for the case. Um, let alone um, faster requests that are unsuccessful or indeed the cases where we get no help whatsoever. Liz. Um, Liz Quintana from uh, the Institute. Um, my question is about the interface or um, relationship with the military and so um, uh, to what extent are, uh, is the presence of the military in Iraq and Syria um, helping uh, in terms of disrupting um, some of the threats that you're facing? Um, and also, as military goes towards a kind of greater defence engagement strategy and has a footprint more broadly, um, will perhaps the, uh, the police zone kind of uh, international engagement um, be coordinated um, in order to meet some of these threats? I mean, firstly, in terms of sort of um, military engagement, uh, that's not my um, sphere of responsibility or expertise, but I would say, of course, ungoverned space like Syria and Iraq, there needs to be an international effort to try and get that back into some sense of, um, away from lawlessness to some, some sense of rule of law. Um, and that's what uh, sort of, uh, our government is wrestling with. Um, in terms of international coordination, we have a high degree of coordination already and the international presence of the security intelligence agencies, of the police, of the military um, is 
currently um, coordinated and we operate in the same areas and of course we bring different skills and different relationships to the table the the police police relationship that's about the criminal justice system whether it's about the ability to work with foreign law enforcement to bring back evidence help in the UK whether it's about um, helping them with their operations locally you need that expertise conversely if it's about building military capability locally and um, stabilizing difficult countries that's where the military come in so it's a very much a partnership that is coordinated and we of course work in the same regions because that's where the problems are hmm. lady here hi uh, nicola baxter i'm a student at the university of westminster do you believe that there could be more mechanisms put into place to help prevent radicaliz radicalization of young people before it begins that's the sort of um, $64,000 uh, $64, question, isn't it? I think if you look at sort of the programmes at the moment to counter radicalisation, we've talked about a little bit, and those have got some success, um, but I'm sure we'll look back in a few years and find there were better ways to have operated because it's still a fairly, uh, a fairly new discipline. In terms of preventing it, I, it's a personal view, it's... It, it's not based on massive research in that area because that's again not my responsibility but what I do see is that it's about local leadership I think is the biggest um, biggest issue and anything that can support and enhance local leadership of people with sort of um, uh, sort of moderate and constructive views I think is to be welcomed uh, sort of we sometimes get involved in some of the issues from from um, from the policing perspective I think some of, some of the ones that interest me for example are um, equipping and strengthening sort of women's networks in in in, uh, in in sort of Muslim communities seems to have a positive effect as a as a balancing point against <coughs> the majority of young people who move towards terrorism whilst there's increasing number of women the majority are young men and um, the sort of women's networks approach does seem to have some effect gentleman in the front row here thank you uh, assistant commissioner Simon Imbert from ESRI um, given the uh, undoubted support that the police service enjoys from the public at large and, and all sectors of it. I isn't it about time that we named and shamed these companies on the communications and social media side who frankly would therefore suffer uh, reduced funding, uh, probably struggle to recruit the right sort of people and inevitably reduce their revenue? Uh, if their revenue was going to fall down overnight that may be attractive. The problem is if I was to say here well, if criminals use um, application X, then it's fine because we we've got a great relationship with the company. But if they use application Y, we're completely stuffed. Then um, the sort of you could guarantee what criminals and terrorists would do the next day. And I think that's the difficult issue that we're wrestling with, that we're trying to explain. I think it's my job as a senior police officer to, in a practical way, as far as I can do, explain sort of strengths and challenges that we're wrestling with day in day out and that's what I'm trying to do in, in sort of the things I've described but I have to stay half a pace away from the detail otherwise I simply help criminals and terrorists and the problem with that I, I, I see the problem with it it, it makes mm. it look slightly sort of um, obtuse perhaps the way it's described because I'm having to caveat and be very careful with my language which is why I'm trying to be quite very candid here that conversely the reason I can't do that is if I step <laughs> too far I simply accelerate the rush of criminals and terrorists into our blind spots. So it's one thing having blind spots, it's a whole uh, different thing advertising them and helping people find them. Very good. Right, uh, there are two gentlemen here uh, at the back row. Uh, Nick Beek from BBC London News. Assistant Commissioner, you said that about 600 people uh, a month are being referred to you across the country and about 10% of those you look at and you deem them to be of concern. You know. CT context. A um, couple of questions. First of all, what proportion of those are in the, the greater London area, would you say? And what is the nature of your concern about the things they might be getting into? So, uh, when I say of concern of a CT context, what I'm saying is here's an individual who perhaps a teacher or a friend or a community leader has said, um, we're worried about X, that they're being drawn towards extremism, radicalisation. So our first sort of check is, are they, I know, are they, is one of their friends a, a terrorist that we're doing an operation on, things like that. So we dismiss that. 
The second stage of data is working with partners. So what do education, what do um, health services, what do, what do everyone know about them? And it's at that point, actually, yeah, this person is vulnerable and it does seem that there is some perhaps malign influence over them for someone extremist, maybe online, maybe in, in the local community. And it's at that point you have to sit down as a group locally and work out what can we do about this. If there's an extremist in the community, then actually that's probably a, a police have got a role in trying to disrupt that individual and break that relationship. If there's a vulnerability because of mental health or youth, then there are obviously specialist local services who can help in that. And it's that shared endeavour of safeguarding the vulnerable, which we are working together on, mm. where the police can bring the partners together and we can take away the more hard-edged interventions such as disrupting extremists. And the gentleman next to you. Sorry, I was just going to say, oh, you said sorry. previously about half of the returnees are from the London area. I mean, I haven't got the exact data, but it, it, almost every index you look at, you tend to find about half of the threat, half of the risk tends to be in London. Hmm. Please. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ewan Grant, um, Rusi member and former customs and excise intelligence analyst. My question perhaps follows on a bit from a couple of questions before. Um, Rotherham and Oxford, which were of course by no means purely uh, or maybe even mainly police failings, are there any indications of um, qualitative as well as the quantitative improvement you referred to in more and better and better joined up reporting, uh, perhaps particularly from organisations which weren't terribly proactive in the past. And I can't help feel that, in, as I suspect there, has, there have been improvements, as you implied, um, that that may also rather name and shame some of the social media companies. Uh, sorry, I, I'm now a bit confused. I thought your question was more about relationships with local partner agencies. At yeah, local yes, yeah, but okay. that's just yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. an aside yes. on that. The, the, sorry, the aside, at the end, um, it, the aside at the end confused me. Yes, but I think the answer to that is, is yes, and I'll give a couple of ways of illustrating that. So these aren't simply referrals, which is a sort of fire and forget. Every one of these cases requires shared activity at a local level to look at so somebody has said, I know a teacher or a friend has said, I'm worried about X. It takes a lot of combined effort to get the full picture to say, actually, is this a false call with good intent, as many of them are? Or is this somebody where actually there's some vulnerability or some, some real threat? So um, that takes a lot of shared effort, which persuades me it's beyond simply firing and forgetting duty. It's actually a real partnership. Uh, and we all, uh, we, I think we see so much help at a local level I think the strength of the relationships is also indicated by the number of arrests we've been making over the last um, over the last year or two, and every one of them has been managed sort of calmly and sensibly at a local level. So I think the engagement and relationships of local policing, community policing teams with the community um, in high risk areas, you've got um, prevent office, police officers involved with that as well. The role of local authorities means that every one of these difficult operations goes well, even when on one or two occasions we've had to. That in, has involved searching a, searching a mosque in West London as your number one operation. Being able to manage that smoothly is a testament to the quality of relationships, not just the numbers. Gentleman at the back here. Martin Bentham from the Evening Standard. You mentioned uh, dangerous operations that have had to run uh, longer than you would have liked. Have there been cases amongst those where you have actually been to communications companies and they have explicitly re either refused to provide information that would have helped you uh, bring those operations to a close sooner, or you've gone to them and they've said uh, that they would alert the people under surveillance uh, as a result of your inquiry if they provided the data. And a second question, if I may, uh, on the ungoverned spaces of Iraq and Syria, have there been actual plots that you, among those you foiled this year, that have been directed by people in those Britons in those ungoverned spaces? The, the second point, uh, I'm not going to go into specifics of individual ones, some are, some are concluded and some, some aren't, but uh, sometimes Syria is a direct link in terms of directing um, and organising and sometimes it's more of, a, of an influence of people who are vulnerable who then act on their own and we've seen a, we've seen a, mix, of, a mix of that. And I've just forgotten the first part of the question. The first part of the question? The yeah, I, I'm not going to go into the specifics of individual operations um, but the, the sort of things I spoke about in terms of 
actually we can't have the data because if we do they're going to tell the offender or having to delay things because of encryption those are real um, those are real cases and real examples I'm just not going to identify the specifics for all the reasons I've described I think there's somebody a couple rows further forward just here please Tom Weiser from the Daily Telegraph it's actually a related question but you could just clarify now in terms of that situation with the companies has it been the case where you therefore haven't pursued the request to get the information because you know they will tip off the suspects? Yes, yeah, Or have there been yeah. cases where you've later discovered that the suspect has been tipped off following a request? It's definitely the former. I can't remember any of the latter, but I'm, I'm not certain. And just on the 600 referrals, can we assume that the majority of those are Islamist-related? As, as in the radicalisation? There, there are some extreme right-wing and some other um, uh, sort of sort of singular cases in there, but the majority is in relation to sort of Islam, Islamist terrorism. And right in the front here, please. Jim Sibold, Esri, and a member. Assistant Commissioner, um, I take your point about being a cult, and I think it's very apropos. And when we catch these people, when we then put them into prison, um, is that becoming a breeding ground for radicalisation again? And how far does prevent go into the prison structure? Radicalisation in prisons is a, a real challenge. As, of course, we are putting more terrorists and extremism, extremists into prison, and it is something I know that the uh, Ministry of Justice and, and um, Michael Gove are working hard on a new strategy in terms of if this looks like a sustained growth of a challenge for them in prison, um, how are they going to deal with it? And they are working on that and consulting us at the moment. Please. <coughs> Chris Hall, member, uh, with the massive um, influx of uh, refugees, migrants from the Middle East going into the continent, are you upping your uh, liaison with the German police, BND, and other agencies? And we've got good liaison, uh, good liaison across Europe already, um, and of course, you constantly have to look at. Um, all the data you can share with each other and assessing assessing any risk but at the moment there is no specific information that that is being used as a route but clearly we have to be alive to the possibility gentleman at the front here jack mayman from the press association um do you think that social media companies are being irresponsible when it comes to uh, perhaps a lack of cooperation uh, when it comes to requests for information from the met Absolutely. Um, I, I think it's challenging for them in the sense of they're developing new business models and working at speed. And some of these companies are very new and then within a year or two they're work ex worth extraordinary amounts of money. Which is why I make the comparison with the banking sector where you've got institutions developed over decades or hundreds of years really and therefore that maturity about how do they maintain their integrity and independence and yet collaborate appropriately with police intelligence agencies it took them a long time to get there. The challenge is we can't afford such a long time, uh, such a long time today. And it's it's easy for it's easy to say glibly, well, that's our business method. That's how we design things. We design them with I know in built encryption for the following reasons. And I'm not a technology expert. And I, I wouldn't pretend to be. Um, but it seems to me if you go back to if we are glibly creating safe operating environments criminals and terrorists we are going to we are going to regret it if we don't try and turn that corner turn round, turn that round again very very quickly just briefly if i may come back please um, what, what percentage if it's possible uh, of the companies that you're dealing with would you say are being difficult or perhaps are lacking in cooperation would you say it's the minority or the majority uh, it, so i in my speech i said there are some who are helpful some who are partially helpful and some very unhelpful. And it's not, the number in each of those pots is not insignificant. So there's a spread across there. Gentleman at the back here. Thank you, Steve Donnelly, National Committee of the Red Cross. So you talked um, at length about the success of CD policing being linked to the excellent sort of networks you have at the local and national and international level. If you look at the United States, for example, <coughs> one of the criticisms has been the lack of join-up you know, between the myriad of law enforcement agencies over the years. And I know that they've 
gone to considerable lengths to try and close those gaps. Are you concerned at all that with the what could be argued to be the recent fragmentation of policing, um, we have sort of a lot more local accountability, but we have perhaps competing demands at the local level, the national level. You have the National Crime Agency, which is a relatively new body. Um, are you concerned that there's a potential for us to replicate some of the mistakes that have been say in the, made, say, in the United States? I mean, there, is, there isn't an increasing number of agencies in policing and enforcement. So whilst the NCA is a new, a new body, it's, a sort of, it's built out of previous, um, previous organisations um, and trying to take the fight against organised crime um, further forward. I, I think actually our, our strength is, comes out of our structure, which as I said, where I am accountable partly to um, uh, Sarah Thornton who sat in the sec second row and um, <laughs> National Police Chiefs Council, who I lead CT policing um, with, their, with their sort of fiat and blessing and work with the chiefs who host the units across the region and report back on a regular basis on the operations and the challenges we're facing. So we're doing that join up across the country. And whilst it's probably not a structure that you would start at with a blank sheet of paper, I think it is uniquely well equipped for today to have, say, units that are dispersed and locally embedded with some real local interest because I know the unit in Manchester is, um, is, sort of is within the force and on the terms and conditions and looked after by the by Greater Manchester Police but coordinated from London working nationally. I think it creates that balance of local versus national, which is really helpful in the current environment. The, the danger is if you are too distant from the local, <coughs> you risk missing all that local intelligence and being able to join up and operate with agility and effectiveness locally. If you're too local, you can't operate nationally and, and take a sort of strategic view mm -hmm. across the country. And I think we're able at the moment to straddle the balance of that well. We only have time for one last question, and in the front row, David, please. Thank you. Um, very interesting. But when we think of uh, terrorism, we think, uh, well, I do anyway, uh, to what degree does the political agenda seem to set the tone for future terrorism? Now, to what degree do you think our politicians can help in this respect in the uh, setting the agenda, you know, to ensure that um, they're more sort of responsible uh, with regard to their sort of uh, uh, international viewpoints on, on issues that create terrorism? I think it's normally for politicians to mark my homework rather than for me to mark their homework. Um, <laughs> I, I think the sort of some of the things that politicians are wrestling with, which I think are essential, so actually that the challenges around data, communications, police and intelligence mm. agency powers and international cooperation is a big challenge that they are uh, very charged with. How to wrestle with extremism is the more that can be done to disrupt extremism with a definition that everyone will buy into and doesn't, doesn't overreach. Um, and how do you generate more, I think, collaboration internationally to deal with the sort of challenging <coughs> problems of places like Syria and Iraq? But there are other broken places, aren't there, like Libya and other countries as well. So. And it's a big agenda for politicians, but I'm <coughs> not going to mark their homework. I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. I always think that the best, uh, best meetings are a bit like a university oral examination in which the, <laughs> the candidate is throwing one question after another, often from totally different directions. Uh, but, uh, and on those criteria, you've succeeded admirably. <laughs> I think you've, you've uh, for me at least, uh, you've demonstrated some of the, the best characteristics of British policing, judicious, pragmatic, uh, uh, but also clear, <laughs> and also uh, recognising the critical importance uh, for policing of cooperation at every level, not least I think you've put forward a rather clear message about the importance of cooperation uh, with the private sector as technology changes very rapidly. So please join me in thanking uh, the Commissioner for his contribution. Thank you. Thank you